Peace be with you, and welcome to The Word Unveiled. Our program is Catholic Beginnings in Detroit, Part 2. This is a production of St. Malachy Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. St. Malachy is a part of the Archdiocese of Detroit. My name is Gordon Peck. I'm the Director of Evangelization Programs for Adults. So as in all things, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you that we live in a land where the gospel is proclaimed with vigor and enthusiasm. Teach us to cherish the freedoms we have in giving due praise to you, our Lord. Teach us to always worship you and to love our neighbors as ourselves, as our Savior Jesus Christ teaches us. May our faith grow richer and more complete every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So the time period we're going to cover is 1700 to 1875. What you see on a screen is Fort Pontchartrain, the first settlement at Detroit. The landscape of the nations, if you will, in uh, what was New France, or the, that part of North America that we're most concerned with, was occupied by indigenous nations that spoke basically two different languages, Algonquin or Iroquois. The Iroquois were in mostly New, uh, New York State, and certain parts of the province of Ontario, and the Algonquin people, Algonquin-speaking people, were all around. The red dots indicate the principal French uh, settlements, uh, Quebec City on the ocean, uh, Montreal, and then the St. Marie among the Hurons was established in 1615. On the seaboard, we have British colonies in Massachusetts and Dutch colonies in uh, New York State on the Hudson River. We left off the story last time when we talked about uh, Antoine de Lomé de la Mothe Cadillac. Well, in 1698, Cadillac had returned to France and he presented a brief to Minister Pontchartrain, who was the secretary over all the colonies, and he asked to establish a permanent colony on the Detroit River. So on May 27, 1699, the king decreed that it should be carried out. And Cadillac was commanded to achieve a six-fold mandate. First, he was to prevent the beaver trade from falling into Iroquois hands. Secondly, he was to deliver, deliver the highest quality pelts, since there had been a mediocre uh, quality of pelts delivered in recent years. Th third, he was to establish work for the Courier de Bois, that is the French uh, French-Canadian fur trappers. Then he was to guarantee benefits for the merchants who would go into these settlements and uh, distribute goods. And then he was to reunite all the allied uh, indigenous nations at the Detroit Post, bring them back to closer relationship with the French. And then last of all, uh, thanks to colonists and missionaries, assimilate all the people there, including the Indian nations, into uh, a new French nation. Well, when Cadillac returned to Montreal from France in 1700, he, uh, he, he began his effort to establish a city at Le Détroit, and he put together a band of individuals. He, he uh, recruited 50 soldiers and 50 courier de bois, fur traders, uh, and, and others, other French Canadians, who were ready to establish farms or trading posts in the new land, and he had with him also two priests. So Cadillac's scheme was to invite all the indigenous nations, that's all the Huron people, uh, all the uh, Algonquin-speaking people, to come down to this new area that he was going to establish. So he moved the trading post from Michelin-Mackinac in the north of Michigan all the way down to Le Détroit. This would be very close to the Iroquois. He wasn't content to simply move the trading post. He was content, he, in his mind, he was going to build an empire, and it was going to make him personally very rich. So after six weeks of travel, the party came to the narrowest part of the straits between Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, or Lac St. Clair and Lac de Erie. And it was July 23rd, 1701. They continued southward, the river got wider, and they stopped at a large island in the middle of the river, which they named Gros Eel, Big Island. And they camped there for the night. So this is the route that he took. He left Montreal, and he followed the Ottawa River, made a portage through Lake Nipissing into the Georgian Bay, and then came down Lake Huron from north to south, past Port Huron, and, to, into, and through Lake uh, St. Clair, and into uh, the Straits of Detroit, where he founded the new settlement. And after that was done, 
the trading post at Michela Mackinac, uh, St. Ignace, was closed. So it was on the morning of July 24th, 1701, that Cadillac's group returned to the narrowest part of the river and they landed on the shore and they landed on the north side of the shore and a little space that was bounded by the Savoyard Creek and the river. So they had water on basically three sides of them. The location, if you're familiar with the city of Detroit, is where the Pontchartrain Hotel and the uh, Veterans Memorial Building stand. So it was right in that region. There he built a storehouse and a stockade. Construction on that began immediately. However, the first building that was completed was St. Anne's Church two days later on July 26th, which happened to be the feast day of St. Anne's, and hence they consecrated the church to to St. Anne, the mother of our Blessed Mother. And Cadillac named the new settlement Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit, Détroit meaning straight of water, uh, in honor of his patron and supporter in Paris, the guy who was backing his his, uh, project. The two priests who had accompanied Cadillac on his mission were Father Nicolas de la Haye, he was a Franciscan, and Father Francois Vaillant, he was a Jesuit. And Father Vaillant was unhappy from the start because Cadillac uh, showed apparent favoritism of the uh, Franciscans. And and he's also upset with Cadillac because Cadillac uh, told him he had fully intended to sell brandy to the First Nations people, and he was encouraging marriage between the soldiers and indigenous women, and he left Detroit, and the the, uh, father, uh, Vaillant, was not happy with any of that, so he left Detroit after just two months, and he went back to Montreal. But the disregard was mutual because Cadillac had already complained about the priest to the governor in Montreal. So St. Anne's wound up being ministered by the Franciscans under the leadership of Father Lahaye. Now, the palisade, the walled enclosure for the new settlement, was a stockade. Uh, It was constructed of logs about six to eight inches in diameter. They were vertically driven into the earth about three feet deep, and they rose about 12 feet into the sky. The settlement had two gates, uh, one on the south side along the Detroit River, which would allow them to go down and fetch water, and the other was on the east side near St. Anne's Church, so people living outside the church outside the stockade, could access the church through that gate. And then in the corners, there was a uh, bastion or a blockhouse for lookout and for defense purposes. And some sources said that Cadillac had a, uh, a moat dug around the, uh, the, the stockade as well, but it was a dry moat. Now inside, <clears throat> there was a St. Anne Street. It ran east to west along the southern wall. It was uh, 22 feet wide. Uh, St. Joachim was par- parallel to this street. And, and it was north of St. Anne's. And then there was a couple of smaller streets, St. Francois and St. Antoine. St. Antoine Street still exists. And then a large building, large by their standards, was 22 feet by 37 and a half feet and eight feet tall. This was a warehouse. And it was meant to be where they would put any stores that they would receive that would come back, come down to them from Montreal. And it was also used in cold weather as a warming station. So anybody that was a soldier on duty, uh, a fur trader who's just passing through, could go inside of it and and warm up. And then there was also a public bakehouse. So the bakery was shared by everybody. But let's talk about St. Anne de Détroit. The church was the, is the second oldest continuously operating parish in the United States. And there have been eight churches so named in the within the parish since its inception. The first six were wooden structures, and several were des- destroyed by fire. Uh, Cad- Cadillac began to act like a feudal lord in administering Detroit, even more so than he was allowed to do. The land grants were technically free, but Cadillac controlled all trade. So if a farmer wanted to have his grain ground into flour, he had to pay a fee to Cadillac because the only grist mill was owned by Cadillac. If somebody wanted to bake their bread, they had to use Cadillac's ovens. Or if they traded livestock, they had to pay a fee to Cadillac for the sale of the livestock. If they own, and then Cadillac owned the only horse. So if they wanted to plow their their field, they had to rent his horse. And on top of that, he got 10% fee on all fur transactions. Well, the land was distributed in the pattern of ribbon farms. And this had been started on the St. Lawrence River in around Quebec and around Montreal. And the idea was that you you, uh, everybody needed access to the river. It was the only real way to uh, to move about. It was too difficult to move over the, 
over the land and through the woods. And so if you had access to the river, you could bring your, your produce down to the river and take it by canoe to the mills. So these ribbon farms were about 250 feet wide, and they were as much as three miles long. Uh, the objective was to give each farmer access to the river, and there are vestiges of these ribbon farms that still exist. If you're familiar with the Beaumont Hospital in Gross Point, and it was earlier called Bon Secours Hospital, the original parking deck was between two rows of houses. So that city block was actually divided into three strips of land, and those were actually the remnants of ribbon farms. At uh, At the Detroit Medical Center, that space that's between the the hospitals, it's there because that was a ribbon farm and there was a covenant against building on it. So ribbon farms, you can find vestiges of ribbon farms throughout the city of Detroit today. So now Cadillac invited all the nations, the indigenous nations from the north and the south to come to Detroit and trade with the French. That was part of his mandate. And so he he was, uh, the idea was to dissuade them from trading with the English, that they would They could come here, they could trade with the French, and they would get better prices for their pelts. But too many people came to Detroit, and pretty soon the surrounding area didn't have enough wild game to support all these nations. So friction started to develop between the different nations, and the smallest issues turned into big arguments. So Cadillac was promising everything, but he could deliver very little. These Tribal feuds caused most of the nations to eventually, over the next few years, to depart and and return north. By 1706, only five years after the uh, settlement, fighting erupted between the French and the Ottawa, and Father de la Haye was killed, and St. Anne's Church was destroyed by fire. Uh, And the the first six churches of St. Anne's will be constructed within this little fort enclosure. Here's sort of a history of the churches at St. Anne's. The first church lasted all of two years. It was destroyed in an attack by the Ottawa. The second church, built in 1703, only lasted three years, and that was destroyed by an alliance of tribes, and Father Lahai was killed in that incident. The third church was constructed in 1706, but it was also badly damaged by an attack by an indigenous peoples. only lasted two years. In 1708... The fourth church was built, but then more people came to the city, and it was deemed to be too small, so it was replaced by a larger church in 1712. And that lasted for quite some time. It lasted through the whole French era, and it lasted through the the British era, and even into the American era, and then it was decided that it was too small, so uh, a larger church was built in 1796, but it was destroyed in the Great Detroit Fire of 1805. Finally, the seventh church was the first non-wood, non-log church, and it was built in Cadillac Square, and it was demolished after after 1889, which was only after the present eighth St. Anne's was built in 1886. And in 2019, the current church was designated as a minor basilica. So going back to 1702, the year after the, the settlement was set, was established, The wife of Cadillac and the wife of his uh, lieutenant, um, uh, Marie-Thérèse Cadillac and Marianne de Tanti, uh, came to Detroit. They were the first European women to come to the city. And Marie-Thérèse, Cadillac's wife, became the first physician uh, for the colony. And she also assumed some of the administrative tasks that her husband didn't handle too well. He didn't keep good records, maybe because he didn't want people to know what he was really doing. But she tried to straighten out the books. She sent the records uh, back to Quebec and to Paris, but it was too late. There was already a lot of written complaints that were arriving in both both places about Cadillac. So he tried to, uh, he, he, he made an unsuccessful request to be named the Marquis of Détroit. So, but that was turned down or ignored. And disappointed, but ambitious as ever, he then sought to obtain an independent government for the Western Post. He wanted to break away from New France. He didn't want to be under the governor in Quebec. He wanted to be his own governor. But Governor Vaudreuil, who was in Montreal, he he uh, stopped that effort. And then it wasn't until 1706, but then again, that's only five years after he established the settlement, Excuse me. And then again in 1707, that Versailles, that is Paris, acknowledged the evidence. The colony had indeed 
been developed at Detroit, but its presence had not consolidated the ties between the tribes of the West and the French, and almost all of the furs failed to find their way to Montreal, and there was now no doubt but that Cadillac himself had actually traded with the English to get more money, and he distributed alcohol and bribed certain other Canadians who might otherwise have become his adversaries. So he put people on the take, and he was running his own little enterprise. Soon after this, Pontchartrain, the, his friend in, back in Paris, reassigned Cadillac. He, he made him the governor of Louisiana, which was a post that Cadillac didn't want because there was nothing going on in Louisiana. He had effectively been kicked upstairs. Uh, but even in Louisiana, he made enemies, and he was soon recalled to France. Upon his return to France, he was incarcerated in the Bastille, the, the, the national prison, and he was awaiting his judgment because he had spoken out against the government and the state and the colony. So his big mouth got him into trouble. But he had a, had a few friends. And so he, he was freed at the beginning of 1718 after languishing there for a few years. And then he returned to the good graces of the court. They gave him a kind of a phony award. And they gave him the governorship of a small city, which was near where he was born. And he died there on October 15th. 1730. Now, between 1690, before Detroit was founded, and 1745, the French and English colonies in North America were caught up in a series of wars. Most of those originated in Europe and then spilled over into the New World. But in 1754, a skirmish near Fort Duquesne, which is the site of Pittsburgh, brought the French and the First Nation peoples from the Detroit area into the conflict. This conflict would be known as the French and Indian War. And at that time, there were 60,000 French in all of New France and Louisiana combined, but there were over 1 million people in the American colonies. So France lost this conflict. Uh, it was called the Seven Years' War in, in Europe. And in Europe, it involved France, Spain, Sweden, Austria, and Russia on one side against Great Britain, Hanover, and Prussia on the other. But Great Britain, Hanover, and Prussia won. And as part of the war reparations agreement, France ceded all of New France to Great Britain, and that included Detroit. So there's a new landlord in town. In 1760, Major Robert Rogers was sent to Detroit. This was the year after fighting in North America had ended to receive the surrender of the fort and assume command of the entire Great Lakes area. Rogers was an American from Connecticut. He, was, uh, he had developed a group of soldiers they were known as Rogers Rangers, and they fought in the manner of the indigenous people and not like the European troops who lined up in battle formations. They fought more like the indigenous people, and he was both feared and respected among these people. The changes in Detroit were immediate, and the language, culture, and regulations of the British rulers was in very stark contrast with what had been familiar to the French. The change was specifically drastic to, for the people of the First Nations because previously they had, they had a choice of who to take their pelts to for trade. But now there was only one buyer in town. So, of course, the prices dropped drastically, creating much unrest and grumbling among all of the indigenous peoples. This resulted, this complaining resulted in, in, a, in a conflict we call Pontiac's Rebellion. So, with the new British rulers in Detroit, uh, an Ottawa man named Pontiac, or in probably in uh, his own language, it was probably Obwandiag, he organized all of the nations, and he attempted to drive the British from Detroit and other outposts, and he very nearly succeeded. He, he uh, drove them out of uh, all of the area around Chicago, um, uh, northern Michigan, Mackinac, uh, all those areas into, into Ohio. He drove them out of all of those trading posts. He didn't drive them out of Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Niagara. Those are the only three places that it didn't happen. But in Detroit, they were besieged for many weeks. And so the British that were locked up inside of Detroit, they finally decided to uh, make a raid on Pontiac's villages. Pontiac had established villages in the Gross Point area. The British troops were then ambushed at Perrance Creek, which is the Battle of the Bloody Run. And this is about where Mount Elliott Street is um, in, in Detroit, around Jefferson and Mount Elliott. And so the British were defeated and driven back into the fort. And the stalemate went on for many, many months until a French officer, Cadet de Quinder, 
notice how all these names are Detroit streets now. Uh, De Quinder came from New Orleans, and he told Pontiac that the French were not coming back. His rebellion was useless. And so it, it fizzled out and, and it ceased. Now, the French themselves weren't too happy about the British uh, ruling in Detroit either. So uh, in 1760, some of the French rulers, they decided to go across the river and attend mass at the Huron Mission Chapel. So they went over to a chapel that had been established for the Huron Nation. And the little church was granted parish status as Our Lady of the Assumption Church. It was administered by the Diocese of Quebec. So because it was in Canada, it was administered by Quebec, whereas uh, uh, St. Anne's in Detroit was in the British colonies, and so that was administered by the Diocese in Baltimore. So the next church to to be established in the Detroit area was down by Monroe, which at that but which wasn't called Monroe originally, but was called Frenchtown. It was on the Raisin River, and it was named Saint Antoine à la Rivière au Raisin, and that was in 1788. Now it's known as Saint Mary of the Immaculate Conception, and this is the second oldest parish in Michigan. Now, on October 15, 1788, this would be in the um, still in the British time period. Father Pierre Frechette. Uh, He was the pastor at St. Anne's. He organized this new parish on the Raisin River. The first first church was a square log building measuring 30 feet on a side, and the pastor slept downstairs and worship occurred on the second floor. The little church was the current church that is there now was begun in 1839 and has been extensively renovated and expanded. The way the the French in the city of Detroit, or I should say the village of Detroit at that time, started to move out, and they mostly moved south. And here's an account of a letter written by Father Gabriel Richard in 1822, and it talks about where people were living. And he lists Fort Meggs, which was the name of Toledo. Uh, It had 16 Catholic families there. Uh, Eight miles north of that was St. Joseph's on Miami Bay. There were 54 families there. Six miles north of that at Otter Creek, 27 families. In the town of Monroe, or Frenchtown, on, on the Raisin River, there were 40 Protestant American families, but there were 110 Canadian Catholic families. Three miles north of that at Sandy Creek, there were 15 more families. Six miles north of that at Swan Creek, seven families. And eight miles to the north of that at the mouth of the Huron River, there were eight families. So the French basically moved to the south. Now, a little bit prior to this time period, Within, the, within all of the American colonies, within the, the British American colonies, there was a, uh, an event called the Great Awakening. It was a religious revival. It lasted uh, through the 1730s and the 1740s. And the movement came at a time when the idea of secular rationalism was being emphasized by certain philosophers. And a passion for religion had grown stale. So this was a rejuvenation. And Christian leaders traveled from town to town preaching the gospel, emphasizing salvation from sins, and promoting enthusiasm for Christianity. So the result was a renewed dedication toward religion. And this increased reliance upon God in the destiny of nations became an integral part of the spirit that fed the American Revolution. So it's not by accident that our national motto is, in God we trust. So between the years 1775 and 1781, The War of Rebellion against Great Britain breaks out within the American colonies, and a French-Canadian man from Detroit by the name of Jean-Francois Hamtramck, or Hamtramck as we say it now, he served in the American army, and he was present with Washington at the Siege of Yorktown. Now, the treaty that ended the war, the Treaty of Ghent, was signed in Belgium in 1783, and this granted freedom to all the 13 colonies, and it also awarded the region of the Great Lakes, including Detroit, to the new nation, the United States of America. However, the British garrison at Detroit refused to yield the outpost to the Americans, and they didn't do it in 1783. In fact, it wasn't until 1796 that Detroit was surrendered to the Americans following a victory by the American general, Anthony Wayne, over indigenous nations that had aligned themselves with the British and resisted American authority. And after that, on July 11th, 1796, a detachment of American soldiers under the command of Colonel Jean-Francois Hamtramck, 
finally reached Detroit and assumed command of the post. Now, the next person to arrive in Detroit was very significant, and that's Father Gabriel Richard. He can truly be called the father of Detroit. He was born on October 15, 1767, at St. Ange in southwestern France, and he entered the Society of Priests of St. Sulpice on April 10, 1790. Now, this is a difficult time to be a priest in France. He was ordained October 9, 1791, but the French Revolution has broken out, and priests are being rounded up and, and guillotined. So he narrowly avoided being guillotined. He was smuggled out of France on a ship that contained seven other priests, and they sent them to the United States to be to, to safety. So in 1792, he arrives in Baltimore, and there he winds up teaching mathematics at St. Mary's Seminary, excuse me, St. Mary's Seminary, until he was assigned uh, by Bishop John Carroll to do missionary work on the frontier with native people in what is now Kaskaskia, Illinois, and later he was assigned to Detroit in the Northwest Territories of the United States. So Father Gabriel Richard, he arrived in Detroit on the feast day of Corpus Christi, June 7th, 1798, to be the assistant pastor at St. Anne's Church. Well, Father Richard becomes the pastor of St. Anne's just a few years later in 1802, and he served in that capacity for 30 years. In 1804, he opened a school in Detroit, but that was destroyed by the fire that leveled the city in 1805. And this is when Father Gabriel Richard wrote the city of Detroit's motto, we hope for better things, it will arise from the ashes. So Father Richard organized the shipment of aid from all the surrounding farms, the ribbon farms and communities to help the people in the city of Detroit uh, and uh, rebuild the, the, the city, and it was rebuilt. Father Richard was a very strong promoter of education. His personal library contained more than just religious books. He had books on philosophy, theology, science, law, history, and literature. He established a school in 1808 at the Spring Hill Farm. This was at one of the ribbon farms to educate Native American and white children together to break down racial barriers. Definitely way ahead of his time. In 1807, he was invited by a Protestant congregation to act as their clergyman because their, their pastor had died. So he did so, and he concentrated on the elements of Christianity where both churches agreed. And, he, and then he brought the first printing press to Detroit in 1809. He printed the first periodical in French called the Essays du Michigan, as well as printing the same document in English, the Michigan Essay, and another document, another uh, periodical called The Impartial Observer. And then, along with uh, Reverend John Monteith, a Presbyterian, he and Monteith founded the University of Michigan under a, under a government act called the Act of Appropriation. And this happened on October, excuse me, August 26th, 1817. And the cornerstone was officially laid in the city of Detroit on the corner of Larned and Woodward. Uh, on September 24th, 1817. Of course, the University of Michigan will relocate to Ann Arbor later on. He was elected a territorial delegate to Congress. Michigan's not yet a state, it's a territory, but he was a delegate to Congress on September 4th, 1823. Took a seat on the Feast of the uh, Immaculate Conception, December 8th, and he was the first priest ever elected to Congress. In his first two months, he proposed 16 different petitions to Congress, and uh, on April 26th, uh, 1824, he began, his, he began his famous motion and enlisted support to build a long road between Detroit and Chicago, and this became known as the Michigan Avenue, and we know it as U.S. Route 12. Well, Father Richard ministered among the native peoples of the region, and he was generally admired by them. When war came again in 1812, uh, the British captured Detroit, and they imprisoned Father Richard. And the uh, Shawnee chief Tecumseh, who hated the Americans and wanted to push him out, respected Father Richard so much that he told the British he would not fight and his nation would drop out of the war unless Father Richard was released from prison. And so he was. In 1818, after the war, Father Richard supervised the construction of the Seventh Church of St. Anne's. 
And there's a photo of it here. It was called the Stone Church, the Stone Building, because it was the first church that wasn't uh, built out of logs or lumber. In the 1830s, uh, a cholera epidemic spread throughout the area, and it and it especially hit Detroit hard. And so Father Richard wound up ministering to the victims of cholera, and until he himself uh, caught the disease in 1832, and he and he died. And in so many ways, he's must certainly be called the father of Detroit. Now, following the War of 1812, more and more American settlers crossed over the mountains, came in through Ohio and into the Detroit area, and they liked what they saw and they started to settle. But like the French before them, they realized the best way to get around was by water, so they settled along the coast. So up and down the Detroit River, through Lake St. Clair, and up as far as Port Huron, all the, all the, the shoreline began to develop first, long before any settlements happened inland. And as the, these Catholic families came into the area, they built chapels because they were too far from Detroit to go back to St. Anne's every Sunday. So they, they started to build little chapels, and the priests started to, to come to them. One of the first was St. Felicity St. Gertrude's Church in what was once called Lance Cruz, which we now know as St. Clair Shores. The original log church <clears throat> was built there in 1826, and it was d- d- dedicated to St. Felicity, and it was built on land donated by the Rattel family, a French-Canadian uh, f- uh, farm family. And uh, Father Bohem was the spiritual shepherd of this church until 1842. Uh, the log church was abandoned because Lake St. Clair's high water levels changed. Climate's always changing. So it came, so it actually flooded the area where the church was. And so they moved a little bit more inland, and they built a new church, and they called that one St. Gertrude's. Um, there is a baptismal record that exists from 1873 that was found at Sacred Heart Parish in Roseville that mentions that Father Hendricks was the pastor of St. Gertrude Church, um, and he was appointed by the Bishop of Detroit, who at that time would be Caspar Borges. St. Gertrude's was established in 1858 as a replacement for St. Felicity. And this photograph here is of the wood and stone church that was built in 1897 and then raised in 1968 to make room for the modern church that's on the property today. But that parish has since ceased to exist and the property is owned by another, uh, another church. Another church that was established early on was St. Paul on the Lake. And this was the first, cat- first Catholic parish in the Gross Points. Uh, the origins of the parish dates back to the 1790s when French Catholic priests would minister to the settlers in what was essentially an agricultural zone. Uh, from 1819 to 1825, there was a chapel in use in the home of Pierre Provencal. There's another street name located near the Renaud family farm on Lake St. Clair, just north of Vernier Road, uh, which is now Gross Point Shores. This house was later moved to its present site on Kircherville Avenue, where it serves as a headquarters for the Gross Point Historical Society. The first building specifically built for worship was a log church, and it was located on the Renaud property, and it was dedicated in 1825 by by Father Francis Badin. He was an assistant to Father Gabriel Richard, who had pastoral responsibility for the entire area. The parish was officially organized in 1835, and in 1848, the log church was replaced by the frame building located on the site of the current church. But the present church building that we're all familiar with was completed in 1899. The older frame structure was used as a parish hall until it was dismantled in 1914. The rectory was added in 1911, and the original portions of the school and convent buildings were built in 1927. Now, the church building has been closed on five occasions. In 1918, during the influenza epidemic, that was the worldwide influenza epidemic, and in 1976, in the aftermath of a powerful ice storm uh, due to a devastating fire, and in both 20 and 2015 due to renovations. I remember that ice storm in 1976. We lived in nearby Harper Woods, and we had a huge tree fall through the roof of our house. So I can understand why they had trouble during that storm. The St. Paul Catholic Church complex is constructed of brick and stone, and it's designed in the French Gothic Revival style. 
The stained glass windows were made by Fredericks and Wolfram Art Glass Company, which existed in Detroit. It was installed in 1901, and the Franz Mayer and Company of Munich, Germany, installed windows in 1924. Okay, in 1833, Pope Gregory XVI created the Diocese of Detroit. So now Detroit was no longer under Baltimore. And he appointed Frederick Riese, uh, the first German, German-born German bishop in the United States. And he was consecrated on October 6th, 1833. So Detroit has a bishop. Um, and he was consecrated by Bishop Joseph Rosati of St. Louis. And he, and he brought the Order of the Poor Ladies to Detroit, uh, the Order of Nuns. And he also established Detroit's first convent and a school for girls. Now, when he arrived in Detroit, the only Catholic church in Detroit was St. Anne's, um, which became the cathedral because there had to be a cathedral church for the bishop. And 11 priests were serving in the entire diocese. And around 1841, he became ill and incapacitated, and he could no longer serve as bishop. But along with the manner of the times, he retained the title of bishop until his death in 1871, a full 30 years later. So in 1837, Michigan became a state, and the diocese boundaries were redrawn to coincide with the, with the state's borders. And Peter Paul Lefebvre, a, another Belgian, came to Detroit in 1841, and he was the co-agitator, uh, excuse me, co-agitor, bishop and diocesan, diocesan administrator. He wasn't given the name bishop because Bishop Reese was still the bishop, but Lefebvre did all the work. Um, during his presence, he did much. He oversaw the construction of St. Peter and Paul Church, which is currently the oldest existing church structure in the city of Detroit. And he died in 1869, and he was buried in St. Peter and Paul Church, and he was ex- succeeded by Bishop Casper Borges. Now, going back up the coast, we d- go to Mount Clemens, and we have St. Peter's Church. So fire and water had played a prominent role in expanding Detroit uh, because with the fire of 1805, people moved out of the city and and, uh, along the coast. And some of them moved into the northeast into an area on the the mouth of the Clinton River. And the large number of the displaced persons were Catholic, and their nominal pastor was Father, Father Gabriel Richard, the zealous apostle who had helped to establish uh, the mission church at St. Felicity, but now there was another church to be established. And in the year 1800, a little log cabin church, very much like this reproduction, called Petite Chapelle, was a uh, little chapel, was created on the Moore Farm on the south bank of the Clinton River. And soon the little chapel could no longer accommodate all the worshipers. So accordingly, a suitable location for a new church was found on the north side of the river, about three miles from the present city of Mount Clemens. Now, Mount Clemens was named after Christian Clemens, who founded the village. The mount comes from an old sign which identified a military livery stable that had existed on the banks of the Clinton River. And this was a situation. There were military troops at Fort Detroit, and there was also military troops at Fort Gratiot, which was in Port Huron. And they would take horses and men and wagons back and forth between these two posts. It's too far to take a single mount that way, so they would stop at the Clinton River and get fresh mounts. So they would remount at Camp Clemens. So remount Camp Clemens got shortened into Mount Clemens, and everybody started calling that part of the Clinton River, Mount Clemens, and that became the city name. Now, in the 1820s, canal fever took over, took over the entire nation. The Erie Canal had just been completed. There were canals everywhere. And in Michigan, they, uh, an enterprising group decided that if they're going to build a canal that's going to link um, Port Huron, the St. Mary's River, the Lake Huron, Lake Erie, with Lake Michigan. They're going to dig it all the way across the lower peninsula of Michigan. And so they started. And they started to dig, and they started to dig. And if you go out to Canal Road in Macomb County, you you will see that the ditch on the south side of Canal Road is very large and very wide. And it was never, <laughs> it's the remnants of a canal. That's why the road's called Canal. It was never finished. Um, and, and so 
So that's why we have the, the canal road, but no canal. Now, in uh, 1845, Father Louis Gillet, he was, he was made the pastor of St. Mary's Parish in Monroe. Uh, and that was the rename of St. Antoine. And he became the, he was, uh, he brought with him some religious sisters and he founded a new group. And the first of, of them to come with him was uh, Mother Teresa Maxim Duchemin. And she was a woman of both African and American descent. She was a co-founder of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, which was the first religious congregation in the United States established by non-European women. And she brought with her one, two, three uh, companions, and they established a, two houses uh, of residency on the banks of the Raisin River. And in January 1846, the first St. Mary's School opened with 40 students. And by April, five additional young women joined the order, and the sisters declared their official name, Sisters Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Immaculate Heart of Mary nuns are still in Monroe, and they still serve in many of our parishes. So back up in Mount Clemens, St. Peter Church in 1870 had a school added to it. And it had a school added to it because the IAHM sisters said that they would they would serve up there. They would teach. Uh, and they... Um, but there was one condition. They had to name the school St. Mary's School, and so it was. So St. Peter's was a church, St. Mary's was a school. And in 1882, Reverend Charles Ricciart, he began building a new church building, and he constructed a new St. Peter's Church, and it was constructed with, uh, the cornerstone was consecrated on Independence Day, and the church was uh when it was complete, it was described in the Mount Clemens Monitor as the finest edifice of its, sign, of its size in the state, uh, the finest architectural ornament of Mount Clemens, a beautiful structure of stone and brick built in a most substantial fashion. But unfortunately, as substantial as it might be, it, it, uh, it was lost in 1957. It was established in 1882. In 1957, a terrible fire swept through it and destroyed it. And in 1960, the present church uh, was was constructed. Now, not all the the uh, churches and all the missions were along the river. As the population became uh, greater and areas along the the lakes uh, became less numerous, the uh, uh, people spread out into other areas. The cholera epidemic also drove people away from other people, and many of the new German Im immigrants who came were fearful of the cholera that it would come back, and so they started to move into different areas, one of which was Connors Creek. Now, that's actually within the city limits now, but there they built a log church in 1839, and over the years, the parish there was known as Kirk and Valda, Church in the Woods, Little Church in the Woods, and the name was later changed to the Chapel of the Assumption, and later St. Mary's in the Woods, before it was finally designated Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Church. Now, their longtime priest, whose name was Am Amandus Vandendreischer, easy for me to say. Amanda Vandendreischer was appointed the first full-time pastor in 1852, and he supervised the construction of the second church. This was dedicated on May 31st, 1853. But he was also a circuit rider besides being the pastor. He celebrated mass at several chapels and missions in different areas. And this map kind of shows he would leave Assumption Parish. He would go up to what was a place called the Utica Junction, and there was a mission church called Sacred Heart there. He would go beyond that to Utica, to St. Lawrence Mission, and he would also ride all the way across the city of Detroit to St. Mary of Redford. So he was serving in all those parishes, all, at, all simultaneously. Now, Connor Creek was heavily wooded, and the parish itself was situated on a vast uh, deposit of clay. So the parishioners decided to roll up their sleeves. They're going to build their own church. They're going to build it out of clay that they have on the site. So they built kilns, and they, they dug up the clay. They put it into molds. They put it into the kilns, and they fired up bricks. And then trees were cut down, and they made their own lumber. And this church that they built from the materials they found on the site was dedicated in 1852. There's a photograph of it there, uh, and it was a beautiful church. And then, as I'd mentioned, Father Van der Dreyscher, while he's building this church and he's doing all this, he's also going to St. Oh, St. Clement and Centerline. I neglected to mention that. He, he went to that church as well, St. Mary's. 
uh, Sacred Heart, Utica Junction, and St. Lawrence out in Utica. And in 1875, on his 25th, <coughs> excuse me, on his 25th anniversary of ordination, Bishop Lefebvre noticed that his health was declining. Well, my goodness, he's working himself to death. And he orders him to limit his responsibilities at, to Assumption Parish alone and stop doing all this circuit riding to all these other churches. So taking the bishop's advice, he asks for a leave of absence, and he returns to his native Belgium for his health. Well, while he's back there, he hears about what's going on at Lourdes, and he decides to go down to France and experience that. So he does. And he goes down to Lourdes, and he experiences that, and he returns to Detroit, and he's all charged up, and he says, I want to build a grotto like I've seen at Lourdes. And so he does. So the name of the church has now changed to Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but it's become more affectionately known as Assumption Grotto. And that's where Vanden, Father Vanden Dreisha died in 1901, and he's buried in his own parish cemetery. At the time of his death, he was only two, he was only one of two remaining parish priests who had been ordained by Bishop Lefebvre. And this is what the Assumption Grotto Church looks like today. Now, one of the mission churches he went to was Sacred Heart in Roseville. And uh, its origin is, again, promoted by the influx of, of uh, immigrants from Ireland, Germany, and Belgium. And they settled in an area called Utica Junction. Gratiot was a trail that went to Port Huron. Uh, there was a Utica road that split off, so that intersection was called Utica Junction. We know it today as Roseville. Um, each Sunday, the families hitched up their horses and wagons, and they made this six-mile trek to their church at Assumption Grotto. So they were these people that were living in this area had six miles to go to Assumption Grotto. But every other week, Father Van der Dreischer would come and visit these people in Utica Junction. He'd arrive on a Saturday, hear confessions, celebrate Mass the following day. And Bishop Lefebvre finally gave permission for a new parish church to be constructed at, at that location. So Father Van der Dreischer was so overjoyed that he immediately hitched up his horse and buggy to deliver the news to them personally, even though he wasn't due there that weekend. Now, back in the city, for over 150 years now, St. Anne's had served as the cathedral of the Detroit Diocese. But the lay board of trustees, who served as administrators of the parish, often found themselves at odds with the bishop. So by the early 1840s, Peter Paul Lefebvre was determined to establish a new cathedral that would be under his control. So land was purchased at the northwest corner of what is now uh, Jefferson Avenue and St. Antoine Street. And the cornerstone was laid in, in June of 1844 for this new church, which would be dedicated to Saints Peter and Paul. So the Church of St. Peter and Paul is the oldest surviving church structure within the Archdiocese of Detroit. The church served as the Cathedral of Detroit from 1844 through 1877. And the buildings that you see in this photograph immediately to the east of it are the origins of the University of Detroit, constructed in 1877. And that's when St. Peter and Paul no longer was the uh, cathedral. So the, the Detroit College uh, was established there um, under the guidance of, and, and then it was expanded and under the guidance of Father John P. McNichols, the university moved many of its programs to a sprawling campus at Livernois and Six Mile Road on the very edge of the city, or Six Mile Road, as we know, is McNichols Road. And here's an interior of St. Peter and Paul. If you haven't been there, I really urge you to make a visit. Just beautiful, the traditional side uh, altars. Here's a view from above and one of the balconies. And uh, here's our friend, uh, St. Kateri Tikawitha. There's, a, there's an icon, a statue to her. And then in the back of St. Peter and Paul, there's little St. Catherine's Chapel. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Next week, we'll talk about immigration to Detroit and how many more churches are built in the city along the lines of the different nationalities that move into the city. And St. Anne's Church will move once again and established churches will expand. So let's conclude in prayer. 
name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.